Controversy at the Capitol. Senate Bill 1062 passed in the House and the Senate, but the Arizona legislature far from having the final say. Clearly you can recraft a bill maybe so that it, that it works better than this bill would have done from a legal sense. But you know, not everything that you can do is something that you should do. The bill, just two pages inciting days of demonstrations, thrusting Arizona into the national spotlight yet again. We've already have gaping wounds and the scab on top of that wound is very, very thin. Uh, it hadn't hardened yet. The turmoil of the Grand Canyon State captivating the nation. This is Arizona Week. Governor Brewer vetoed Senate Bill 1062 Wednesday, 48 hours after it landed on her desk. Her decision welcomed news to opponents of the measure, but upsetting for supporters who say the bill was about religious freedom. The discussion also impacting the politics of the state. Did the bill open the door for political fallout? Here now are Carolyn Cox of the Pima County Republican Party and Paula Abowd, former state legislator representing the Democratic Party, and she says this will hurt the GOP. It's truly devastating the Republican Party. The party itself, and primarily it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be a real problem for Andy Tobin, who's Speaker of the House. He is running for Congress. He is taking the brunt of the heat for ramming this bill through office. And so in his primary and in his general election, if he wins, He's going to have a huge problem. I think another huge problem has been for Martha McSally. She has been deathly silent on this issue. And, you know, as, as, a, as a candidate for Congress to not be weighing in, she has opportunities to step up and be a leader and show who she is and what she stands for. It's not happening. The candidates for governor, all the Republican candidates for governor minus one, have distanced themselves from this piece of legislation. And it's... It is a pariah piece of legislation, and, and what they're doing now is the Republicans are backpedaling and moving themselves actually closer to the gay community as a result of their distancing themselves from well, the I, impact I, I of just this have bill. To, I just have to disagree with you 100% because I think this is beneficial for the gay community, and uh, it simply says that if you are going to refuse service to someone because of your religious beliefs, this bill makes it much more strenuous <clears throat> that you, you know, define what those religious beliefs are and, and why, um, and, and why uh, they have been violated. I think this is a positive step, a positive modification to the um, 1999 law. And does I think this hurt the Republican Party, though? Move, as well, Paula said. I think the way it's being sold is that we are anti-gay, but that's not what the law is about. The law says that if you are going to object to giving service to somebody because of your religious rights, uh, it's much more strenuous that you have to prove that your rights have actually been violated. And Paula, does this then change the political uh, landscape for Democrats moving forward in the state? Uh, the Democratic Party, you know, looks magnanimous at this point for uh, standing up for a community, the gay community, that's uh, being downtrodden by the religious right that has run this piece of legislation across the country. Arizona was the only state that allowed itself to be sucked into this religious agenda to uh, run a piece of legislation that uh, makes the gay community more vulnerable and, and scapegoated. It makes them less vulnerable. But what it does for Arizona is it takes away the potential for all the businesses that wanted to come here, that no longer want to come here, the 500, the half a billion dollars of Super Bowl dollars that would come into the state are in serious jeopardy. So to say that this helps the gay community when it's devastating Arizona's community shows the complete out of touchness of the Republican Party on what they have done, what they've done to the gay community, what they've done to their own reputation, and what they've done to the reputation of, Air of Arizona and the business community. And Carolyn, we initially had Republicans support the bill and then they've backed away. 
Uh, how do you? How would you explain that? Why well, I think that? it's the kind of media coverage that this has been getting that has been distorting what the bill actually does, and so you know it is. It's scaring people away, but. Uh, this bill doesn't do any of the things that, um, as far as driving out the gay community or, or anything like that, it does not do that. In fact, it makes it easier for them to be able to, say, sue a business that they feel has denied them service. And, you know, in, in truth, because I was a business owner, that, that's the last thing a business wants to do is to deny service to any client. Okay, Paul, I'm going to give you the last word on this because a former state legislator, what is happening behind closed doors when a representative throws his or her support behind it and suddenly changes? Well, I, I, I think the, the, the great thing for those three Republican senators that withdrew their support of this legislation is that really gave uh, Jan Brewer cover for vetoing this piece of legislation. Before, it was all the Republicans except three in the House that supported this and so what it shows is there's an awakening awareness of the impact of this piece of legislation on the business community of Arizona. These legislators didn't want to harm the gay community. They instead now are siding with us. They'll be fine. Arizona will be fine if the governor, in fact, does the right thing for the business community and the gay community in this state. What are the sociological effects of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? Does this impact civil rights throughout the state? Arizona Public Media's Christopher Conover sat down with Matthew Whitaker, Director for the Study of Race and Democracy at Arizona State University. Let's talk about some of the more recent history. People now think of Arizona as the home of 1070, as the home of, of, of this particular bill, 1062. Can we get over that reputation, or is that a reputation that will take many, many, many years, generations to get over it. We can get over it, and we can get over it pretty quickly, but in, in order to give, get over it pretty quickly, there has to be some serious and substantive action and changes within our political culture here. Uh, people are very forgiving in America, uh, usually. Uh, we're, we're a place for second and sometimes third chances, and change can happen quickly. But we have to make a concerted effort to want the change, and right now, at least with the many of our elected officials, not only are we seeing people who don't want to make the change, we see folks who are 20 or 30 or 40 years um, behind in terms of the way they, they think about what Arizona is and what Arizona should be. You said this week you were uh, talking to a group, and you're going to be talking about the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, and yet all the questions were on 1062. I guess it's somewhat ironic that these two things are intersecting at the end of Black History Month in Arizona. Painfully ironic. It's one of the reasons why I, I wrote the CNN piece, because I was appalled and very disappointed when I realized that 50, 50 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Section 2 of which articulates um, access to places of public accommodation, irregardless of race, regardless of race and, and, and those type of things, that now we would have uh, you, folks draft a so-called right to discriminate bill. I mean, it, it just flies in the face, uh, in my opinion, of not only um, wisdom or conventional wisdom, it just flies in the face of logic. I, I just don't understand it. And for many people, it's something of a slap in the face to have this legislation introduced this year, the 50th anniversary where we celebrate America taking a large step towards equality and equity and access, bringing all people under one tent. Some Republican members of the legislature or, or were coming out very strongly against it. We had big business coming out very strongly against 1062. In the public eye, as you travel around, you're a professor of history and, and democracy and race. Does that help blunt some of the, the black eye that over this week we've, we've been getting in Arizona, or is that damage done? Whew. We, we've already have gaping wounds, and the scab on top of that wound is very, very thin. Uh, it hadn't hardened yet. And so there's a lot of, of restorative behavior that needs to happen. I think it blunts it somewhat, but a lot of folks don't understand how we even got here in the first place. It, the question is, why does Arizona keep 
inflicting these, the, the, keep the, with, with the self-inflicting wounds. What, what is going on there? What's going on in the mentality of the people who keep introducing this legislation? It does help to have the business community speak out um, in unison against uh, this bill. It also helps recently to have many members of the faith-based community say, we reject this as well, which, which begs the question, if you're introducing a bill that you're claiming uh, you want to do to protect religious freedoms and the state's religious community rejects the bill, what, what's the point? What, what's the purpose? It blunts a little bit, but th there's a lot of damage that's been done because the reputation wasn't that good in the first place. Other states have proposed this. Yeah. Arizona's legislature is the first to pass it. What makes Arizona different? You mentioned a few minutes ago that things have changed. We were in the forefront of uh, 50 years ago of, of making changes, yet now Arizona gets these black eyes. What's changed over the 50 years? Well, what has happened, it, by the time you get to the 1980s, we started to see the beginnings of a seismic demographic shift in Arizona. The Latino population began to explode, and we know that it did, so much so now that the popu Latino population is right around 30 percent, and it's growing even faster. Um, the, the black population is held steady to 5 percent, but we are, are louder than and more engaged than our numbers would suggest. So that scares a lot of people. You have a native community that, that's experiencing in some ways a renaissance in, in uh, fighting for their own um, dignity and self-determination as well. And so people see their Arizona, some folks see their Arizona floating away, fading away. And to a certain degree, it is. Um, some would say that's a good thing. So you see this demographic shift where whites um, who have long controlled the state are, are staring down, uh, uh, you know, staring through a kaleidoscope that's pointing at a history, I mean a future, that's going to be very different than the past that they remember in Arizona. And that fear, I think, has engendered lots of, of, of draconian actions and legislation. I think it's a reflection of their fear about what, Amer what Arizona is going to be. We know, for instance, during the next, next uh, electoral cycle, the presidential electoral cycle, there will be hundreds of thousands of new Latino registered voters. If you think about what Oregon looks like, Oregon went blue this year. Oregon for years was a red state. Many folks think, well, if we don't do something now, um, Arizona may go the way of Oregon, heaven forbid. So I think there's, a lot, there's lots of fear out there that's motivating people to, you know, to erect walls and barriers um, to, to something that it, it's inevitable, to change that's inevitable. Are these walls and barriers, as you said, just the final reaction as we demographically change, or are these things that are here to stay? It's cyclical. It, they're, they're, when you talk about significant change, there's always massive or moderate or min minimal resistance to it. It's just a part of Arizona, I mean, American history and Arizona history. With this demographic change, what we're seeing really is expected. It should be expected. It's, it's, it's one of those last, or we would like to think or hope, last gasps in response or reaction to another set of, of, of serious change, demographic change in our, in our midst. All right. Well, thanks so much for sitting down with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. And joining us to break down the legalese of his Arizona's existing laws are attorney Michael Boreal and to talk about the aftermath, political communication specialist Kate Kensky and political correspondent here at Arizona Public Media, Christopher Conover. Thank you all for being here. Michael, let's begin with you. This was merely a, an addendum to an existing bill or an addition. Yes, the, the proposed bill didn't actually create a new statute in Arizona. It, it changed some language of an existing statute dealing with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, free exercise of religion. Um, in particular, it expanded the definition um, from a religious institution to include a person, a business, a corporation, things like that. Uh, and it also uh, modified what constituted a government action to be um, not just state action, but also application of an existing law. And, and I took that to mean uh, essentially a, a judge's decision or an application uh, would, in a court case. Excuse me, would SB 1062 have made existing laws more clear, maybe more defined? Um, you know, in some ways, um, it, it left a lot of the, the elements the same. Um, it simply expanded um, who would be able to use those as a shield to, uh, to liability. And it didn't actually... Um, make any conduct lawful, it created a, a statutory defense to a, a lawsuit, basically. 
And Kate, uh, the language is very clear, but we saw that the emotion really took over in, in this case and created quite a controversy, a stir. So it's important that when drafting the, these types of bills that it's clear and obvious for people to understand. Well, that, that, that would be ideal if it was clear and obvious. Of course, sometimes when bills are clear and obvious, they don't pass because then people actually figure out the real intent. And so that's one of the things that gets debated in things such as this. I mean, if it turns out that you, know, you think a bill means one thing and someone really defines it in a more specific way, that could be you know, a block to further support. Just two pages, Christopher. You've been covering politics here in Arizona for a while now. Where was the issue? Was it the media? Was it the uh, understanding of that two-page legislation or the attempt at? I think it was a case of uh, the squeaky wheel. Certainly it was postured in the national media and even in the statewide media as an anti-gay bill. As we have talked about in our newsroom, nowhere in the proposal did it ever say who it was targeting, um, if it was targeting at all. It was not written as an anti-gay bill by language. Um, I think what happened was the, uh, the, the LGBT consortium kind of got going first and they were the loudest so it, it picked up momentum as that and certainly they their community could have been you know caught up in all of this as could have uh, religions you know Muslims Jews Christians whoever uh, men women it was very broad it wasn't specific but I think it was just a case of that's who got out first and and stayed out in front. And of course, the case that really drew some attention was what occurred in New Mexico, where the photographer declined to, to photograph a wedding. How does Arizona move forward when it comes to the talk over discrimination? We've talked about those signs that say we reserve the right to refuse service. Michael, if you would explain, uh, where do we go from here? Will people be using the discrimination label when they're denied service? You know, it, it's possible, you know, both federal and state law in, in Arizona recognize um, certain rules regarding public accommodations. So if you run a business that is open to the public and, and basically holds itself out as servicing the public, whether it's a restaurant or a dry cleaner or a hotel, um, you know, there are certain uh, rules requiring you to, to serve people. Um, what Arizona and a number of other states do is they have um, conditions on that where you do reserve the right to review service if someone is disorderly or drunk or uh, violent. Um, so business owners aren't required to serve everyone they're just prohibited from denying service based on someone's protected status. Would this bill then have been unconstitutional? Uh, based on the, on, this, on the reading of it, um, you know, I, I think it certainly would have been challenged you know, at the federal level. And one of the difficulties is if it was, if it was couched as an anti-gay bill, um, federal law does not um, provide uh, homosexuality is not a protected status under federal law. So uh, most cr discrimination claims um, dealing with sexual orientation are under sex and they're kind of what we call bootstrapped um, into that coverage. Um, so it would have been an interesting uh, case. I, I, you know, I can't say that it certainly would have been unconstitutional federally, but um, it, there would have been arguments on, on both sides. And Kate, politically, it was very, very clear that the Democrats were versus the Republicans. Then we had some Republicans saying, I shouldn't have supported that bill. What happens to them now? Well, I think it depends on how they explain themselves and whether or not they decide to partake in potentially future iterations of this attempt couched in a different way in the years to come. And we have we've seen some evidence to suggest that, that, that this was not an issue that will necessarily be dormant. Um, it will come back. And so it depends on how they handle themselves. In terms of the Republicans, I think it's important to, to recognize that what Republicans do at the state level um, isn't necessarily what Republican voters want and isn't necessarily you know, what we've seen from the P Republican Party at the national level. With this particular bill, um, you saw uh, John McCain uh, come out against it, as well as Jeff Flake, and then of course Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich. People that we would consider mainstream Republicans, you can't really get more mainstream than two um, you know, former presidential candidates, you know, being opposed against it. And so the question is, how do Arizona Republicans want to cast themselves? Do they want to try to you know, fashion themselves in terms of mainstream Republicans or go their own way? 
And Christopher, this puts Arizona back in the national spotlight. So what happens next? Everyone is watching Arizona yet again. Of course, I'm referring to SB 1070. It, that is the million dollar question, if you will. Let me just uh, add something to what Kate just said. There was a poll that came out on Tuesday of strong Republican voters. And that poll, it was done by a Republican firm. Uh, and it had 57% of voters, Republican voters in Arizona, urging the governor to veto this, plus or minus 4%. So if you take away the 4%, it's 53% of Republican voters wanted the governor to veto this. Again, maybe a little different shift, as Kate was saying, you know, voters on the ground versus state lawmakers. Arizona now has to figure out how to go forward from all of this attention. The governor addressed that in her remarks uh, when she was announcing her veto and said, we need to stop being divisive. We need to go forward. She chastised the legislature a little bit and said, we have a CPS problem, yet this is the first substantive bill you sent me. She chastised them a little bit. She, in her remarks, I think was trying to get Arizona back on a different track, if you will. Let's put this behind us, stop being divisive, and move forward. Will we see a bill or, or discussions like this again in Arizona anytime soon, Michael? Well, you know, as someone who represents a lot of employers and businesses, um, I, I certainly hope not. Uh, and, you know, I'm a member of many of the, the chambers of commerce, and they were strongly urging uh, Governor Brewer to veto it because it's not the light that we want cast on Arizona. Um, you know, there's growing um, kind of cross-border commerce actions and, and just growing our international presence. And I think a lot of people would prefer that the focus remain there. Kate, would you agree with that? And I would, I would agree with that. I think, again, it depends on how Arizona wants to fashion itself. I mean, clearly you can recraft a bill maybe so that it, that it works better than this bill would have done from a legal sense. But, you know, not everything that you can do is something that you should do. And I think what we've heard from the business community is that if Arizona decides to pass a bill, which they might be able to do and maybe it will be constitutional, you know, businesses from outside, of course, have that right to say, well, then we simply won't come to Arizona. Okay. Thank you all for your analysis. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Christopher Conover joining me again to talk about that conversation we had. That was just hours after the governor vetoed the bill, but already people have formed their opinions about what this means for the state moving forward. Absolutely. It's, it's a big question. What happens now? It's going to continue. The argument is going to continue through this election year. Not long after the governor had issued her veto, we were getting all the emails as we'd talked about different comments. Um, State Senator Al Melvin, who's also running for governor as a Republican from here in Southern Arizona, sent out a, an email basically saying to his supporters, wait, take your time, this will come back again. It's unfortunate that it was vetoed. He's one of the only Republican gubernatorial candidates who was supporting the bill. Um, all the others had come out against it. So that means on the campaign trail, we'll hear about it. Andy Tobin, the State House Speaker who voted for the bill, he sent out a statement saying, yeah, I understand why the governor did what she did. And not long after that, Ann Kirkpatrick, a Democratic member of Congress who Tobin is running against, came out with a statement saying that everybody who pushed the bill through needs to apologize to the state of Arizona. Two of her Republican opponents voted for that bill. So it's going to come up on the campaign trail as we move our way towards November. Are we likely to see apologies and will we see maybe these candidates punished for, for what they said about this bill? Punished is hard to say. Uh, never try and predict the voters has always been my rule. If you, think you, if you think you can, you usually end up wrong. What is interesting, as we talked about, was there was a poll of likely Republican voters, and it was voters, Republican voters who'd voted in the last two primaries. So those are strong Republican voters. And over half of them were urging the governor to veto the bill. It will be interesting to see how that plays in November, or will other issues eclipse this? I mean, it is only February or just about the beginning of March. We have lots of time between now and Election Day, but I think it will come up. How big it will be, only time will tell. 
And we saw this in your interview with Matthew Whitaker at Arizona State University. What is the reputation of Arizona now? A lot of people making references to that SB 1070 time period. Is this yet again on the mend for the state and, and what many say might be a black eye this time around? That's what Whitaker was talking about. He said people are forgiving. The general public is forgiving and people will not necessarily cancel their vacations. The Super Bowl is going to stay here and things like that. But once again, Arizona is in the national media in a way that a lot of people don't want to see Arizona in the national media. How this will play out, again, long term, it's the hot topic this week. Right. Who knows what will be the topic next week? How quickly will people forget? All right, and making a change from that note, what else are we expecting to see from the legislature this next week or so? Well, actually, so much attention was on 1062. The legislature was working on other things this week. One of the things they did was the House gave preliminary approval, still needs more votes by the full chamber, to a bill that would allow surprise inspections of abortion clinics in Arizona. Supporters of that bill say that's the only medical facility in the state you can't make a surprise inspection on. You can make a surprise inspection at a restaurant, but you can't go into an abortion clinic on a surprise inspection. Democrats uh, opposed it, um, and again, the final vote hasn't come down. They said the reason for that is to protect um, a woman's privacy, um, and they were also worried about lawsuits. They actually floated an amendment to the bill that said if this goes through and becomes law and the state is sued, that the money to pay for that lawsuit should come from the House Speaker and the Senate President's budget. That proposal didn't pass, or at least that part of the proposal didn't pass. And Representative Debbie Lesko, who sponsored the bill, suggested on the floor that Democrats could pre prevent a lot of lawsuits and by just telling Planned Parenthood not to sue. I'm not sure that's a particularly likely action uh, to happen. But if it goes through, we'll probably see a lawsuit. And we saw a lot of public outcry over SB 1062. Now we're talking about abortion clinics. Did SB 1062 maybe open the door for people to suddenly be interested in what's happening at the Capitol? And are we going to see this moving forward, more attention from the general public? What's interesting is if we talk to legislative leaders at the beginning of the session, they wanted to get out quickly, no controversy, they're all up for re-election, and just get their job done and get out. Now we've had controversy, now people are paying attention. Again, the public can be pretty quickly distracted also. Who knows what the news will be next week. However, people are watching very carefully right now. How long it lasts and how quickly the legislature can get their work done and get out is a question. And how Arizona uh, will be received by the general public remains to be seen. Okay, Christopher Conover, thank you so much for your analysis and for your coverage throughout this week. And that's our program for this week. Be sure to stay updated on our website at news.azpm.org. And also join us next week as we take a look at the latest water woes throughout the state of Arizona. For all of us here at Arizona Week, I'm Lorraine Rivera.